twelfth series of the paradox. We cannot get rid of paradoxes by saying that they are more worthy of Carroll's work than they are of the Principia Mathematica. What is good for Carroll is good for logic. We cannot get rid of paradoxes by saying that the barber of the regiment does not exist, any more than the abnormal set exists. For paradoxes, on the contrary, inhere in language, and the whole problem is to know whether language would be able to function without bringing about the insistence of such entities. Nor could we say that paradox gives a false image of thought, improbable and uselessly complicated. One would have to be too simple to believe that thought is a simple act, clear unto itself, and not putting into play all the powers of the unconscious, or all the powers of nonsense in the unconscious. Paradoxes are recreational only when they are considered as initiatives of thought. They are not recreational when they are considered as the passion of thought, or as discovering what can only be thought, what can only be spoken, despite the fact that it is both ineffable and unthinkable, a mental void, the aeon. Finally, we cannot invoke the contradictory character of the insinuated entities, nor can we say that the barber cannot belong to the regiment. The force of paradoxes is that they are not contradictory, they rather allow us to be present at the genesis of the contradiction. The principle of contradiction is applicable to the real and the possible, but not to the impossible from which it derives, that is, to paradoxes, or rather to what paradoxes represent. The paradoxes of signification are essentially that of the abnormal set, which is included as a member, or which includes members of different types, and that of the rebel element, which forms part of a set, whose existence it presupposes, and belongs to two subsets which it determines. The paradoxes of sense are essentially that of the subdivision ad infinitum, always past future and never present, and that of the nomadic distribution distributing in an open space instead of distributing a closed space. They always have the characteristic of going in both directions at once, and of rendering identification impossible, as they emphasise sometimes the first, sometimes the second, of these effects. This is the case with Alice's double adventure, the becoming mad and the lost name. Paradox is opposed to doxa in both aspects of doxa, namely good sense and common sense. Now, good sense is said of one direction only. It is the unique sense and expresses the demand of an order according to which it is necessary to choose one direction and to hold on to it. This direction is easily determined as that which goes from the most differentiated to the least differentiated, from things to the primordial fire. The arrow of time gets its orientation from this direction since the most differentiated necessarily appears as past, insofar as it defines the origin of an individual system, whereas the least differentiated appears as future and end. This order of time, from the past to the future, is thus established in relation to the present, that is, in relation to a determined phase of time chosen within the particular system under consideration. Good sense, therefore, is given the condition under which it fulfills its function, which is essentially to foresee. It is clear that foresight would be impossible in the other direction, that is, if one went from the least differentiated to the most differentiated, for example, if temperatures which were at first indiscernible were to go on differentiating themselves. This is why good sense rediscovered itself in the context of thermodynamics. At its point of origin, though, good sense claims kinship with the highest models. Good sense is essentially distributive, on one hand and on the other hand, in its formula. But the distribution which it puts into motion is accomplished in conditions which place difference at the beginning and involve it in a controlled movement which is supposed to saturate, equalise, annul and compensate it. This is indeed the meaning of such phrases as from things to the primordial fire or from worlds, individual systems, to God. Such a distribution, implied by good sense, is defined precisely as a fixed or sedentary distribution. The essence of good sense is to give itself a singularity, in order to stretch it out over the whole line of ordinary and regular points which depend on it, but which also avert and dilute it. Good sense is altogether combustive and digestive. It is agricultural, inseparable from the agrarian problem, the establishment of enclosures, 
and the dealings of middle classes, the parts of which are supposed to balance and to regulate one another. The steam engine and the livestock, but also properties and classes, are the living sources of good sense, not only as facts which spring up in a particular period, but as eternal archetypes. This is not a mere metaphor, it ties together all the senses of the terms properties and classes. The systematic characteristics of good sense are thus the following. It affirms a single direction. It determines this direction to go from the most to the least differentiated, from the singular to the regular, and from the remarkable to the ordinary. It orients the arrow of time from past to future. According to this determination, it assigns to the present a directing role in this orientation, it renders possible thereby the function of provision, and it selects the sedentary type of distribution in which all of the preceding characteristics are brought together. Good sense plays a capital role in the determination of signification, but plays no role in the donation of sense. This is because good sense always comes second, and because the sedentary distribution which it enacts presupposes another distribution, just as the problem of enclosures presupposes first a free, opened and unlimited space, the side of a hill or no. Is it then enough to say that the paradox follows a direction other than that of good sense, and that it goes from the least to the most differentiated through a whim that might only be a mental diversion? To repeat some famous examples, it is certain that if temperature goes on differentiating itself, or if viscosity goes on accelerating itself, one could no longer foresee. But why not? Is it not because things would be happening in the other sense or direction? The other direction would still encompass a unique sense. Good sense is not content with determining the particular direction of the unique sense. It first determines the principle of a unique sense or direction in general, ready to show that this principle, once given, forces us to choose one direction over the other. The power of the paradox, therefore, is not all in following the other direction, but rather in showing that sense always takes on both senses at once, or follows two directions at the same time. The opposite of good sense is not the other direction, sense, for this direction is only a recreation of the mind, its amusing initiative. But the paradox as passion reveals that one cannot separate two directions, that a unique sense cannot be established, neither a unique sense for serious thought and work, nor an inverse sense for recreations and minor games. If viscosity went on accelerating itself, it would eliminate the reasons behind rest in an unpredictable sense. Which way, which way, asks Alice. The question has no answer, since it is the characteristic of sense not to have any direction or good sense. Rather, sense always goes to both directions at once, in the infinitely subdivided and elongated past-future. The physicist Boltzmann explained that the arrow of time, moving from past to future, functions only in individual worlds or systems, and in relation to a present determined within such systems. For the entire universe, the two directions of time are thus impossible to distinguish, and the same holds for space, there is neither above nor below, that is, there is neither height nor depth. Here we rediscover the opposition between Aeon and Kronos. Kronos is the present which alone exists. It makes of the past and future its two oriented dimensions, so that one always goes from the past to the future, but only to the degree that presents, that presents follow one another inside partial worlds or partial systems. Aeon is the past future, which in an infinite subdivision of the abstract moment endlessly decomposes itself in both directions at once, and forever sidesteps the present. For no present can be fixed in a universe which is taken to be the system of all systems, or the abnormal set. To the oriented line of the present, which regularizes in an individual system each singular point which it takes in, the line of Aeon is opposed. This line leaps from one pre-individual sing singularity to another, and recovers them all, each one of them within the others. It recovers all the systems as it follows the figures of the nomadic distribution wherein each event is already past and yet in the future, at once more and less, always the day before and the day after, inside the subdivision which makes them communicate with one another. In common sense, 
sense is no longer said of a direction, but of an organ. It is called common because it is an organ, a function, a faculty of identification that brings diversity in general to bear upon the form of the same. Common sense identifies and recognises, no less than good sense foresees. Subjectively, common sense subsumes under itself the various faculties of the soul, or the differentiated organs of the body, and brings them to bear upon a unity which is capable of saying I. One and the same self perceives, imagines, remembers, knows, etc. One and the same self breathes, sleeps, walks and eats. Language does not seem possible without this subject, which expresses and manifests itself in it, and which says what it does. Objectively, common sense subsumes under itself the given diversity and relates it to the unity of a particular form of object or an individual form of a world. It is the same object which I see, smell, taste or touch. It is the same object which I perceive, imagine and remember. And it is the same world that I breathe, walk, am awake or asleep in, as I move from one object to another, following the laws of a determined system. Here again, language does not seem possible outside of these identities which it designates. The complementarity of the two forces of good sense and common sense are clearly seen. Good sense could not fix any beginning, end or direction. It could not distribute any diversity if it did not transcend itself towards an instance capable of relating the diverse to the form of a subject's identity or to the form of an object or a world's permanence which one assumes to be present from beginning to end. Conversely, this form of identity within common sense would remain empty if it did not transcend itself toward an instance capable of determining it by means of a particular diversity, which would begin here, end there, and which one would suppose to last as long as it is necessary to assure the equalization of its parts. It is necessary that quality be at once stopped and measured, attributed and identified. In this complementarity of good sense and common sense, the alliance between the self, the world, and God is sealed, God being the final outcome of directions and the supreme principle of identities. The paradox, therefore, is the simultaneous reversal of good sense and common sense. On one hand, it appears in the guise of the two simultaneous senses or directions of the becoming mad and the unforeseeable. On the other hand, it appears as the nonsense of the lost identity and the unrecognisable. Alice is the one who always goes in two directions at once. Wonderland exists in an always subdivided double direction. Alice is also the one who loses the identity, whether her own or the identity of things in the world. In Sylvie and Bruno, fairyland is opposed to the commonplace. Alice submits to, and fails at, all of the tests of common sense. The test of self-consciousness as an organ. Who are you? said the caterpillar. The test of the perception of an object as a test of recognition, the woods which is stripped of all identification. The test of memory as recitation, it is wrong from beginning to end. The test of the dream as unity of the world, wherein each individual system comes undone to the benefit of a universe in which one is always an element in someone else's dream. You're only one of the things in his dream, you know very well you're not real. How could Alice have any common sense left, since she no longer had good sense? Language, in any case, seems impossible, having no subject which expresses or manifests itself in it, no object to denote, no classes and no properties to signify according to a fixed order. It is here, however, that the gift of meaning occurs, in this region which precedes all good sense and all common sense. For here, with the passion of the paradox, language attains its highest power. Beyond good sense, Carol's doubles represent the two senses or two directions of the becoming mad. Let us look first at the doublet of the Hatter and the March Hare in Alice. Each one of them lives in one direction, but the two directions are inseparable. Each direction subdivides itself into the other, to the point that both are found in either. Two are necessary for being mad. One is always mad in tandem. The hatter and the hare went mad together the day they murdered time, that is, the day they destroyed the measure, suppressed the pauses and the rests which relate quantity, quality to something fixed. 
The Hatter and the Hare killed the present, which no longer survives between them, except in the sleepy image of the Dormouse, their tortured companion. But also this present no longer subsists, except in the abstract moment, at tea time, being indefinitely subdivisible into past and future. The result is that they now change places endlessly. They are always late and early, in both directions at once, but never on time. On the other side of the looking glass, the hare and the hatter are taken up again in the two messengers, one going and the other coming, one searching and the other bringing back, on the basis of the two simultaneous directions of the aeon. Tweedledee and Tweedledum testify to the indiscernibility of the two directions, and to the infinite subdivision of the two senses in each direction, over the bifurcating route pointing to their house. But, just as the doubles render impossible any limit of becoming, any fixing of quality, and thus any exercise of good sense, Humpty Dumpty is royal simplicity, the master of words, the giver of sense. He destroys the exercise of common sense, as he distributes differences in such a manner that no fixed quality and no measured time are brought to bear upon an identifiable or recognisable object. Humpty Dumpty, whose waist and neck tie and belt are discernible, indiscernible, lacks common sense as much as he lacks differentiated organs. He is uniquely made of shifting and disconcerting singularities. Humpty Dumpty will not recognise Alice, for each of Alice's singularities seems to him assimilated in the ordinary arrangement of an organ, eye, nose, mouth, and to belong to the commonplace of an all too regular face, arranged just like everyone else's. In the singularity of paradoxes, Nothing begins or ends. Everything proceeds at once in the direction of both past and future. As Humpty Dumpty says, it is always possible to prevent that we grow in tandem. One does not grow without the other shrinking. There is nothing astonishing in the fact that the paradox is the force of the unconscious. It occurs always in the space between consciousnesses, contrary to good sense, or behind the back of consciousness, contrary to common sense. To the question as to when one becomes bold, or when there is a pile, Chrysippus' answer used to be that we would be better off to stop counting, that we would even that we could even go to sleep, we could think later on. Carneades does not does not seem to understand this response very well, and he objects that, at Chrysippus' reawakening, everything will begin anew, and the same question will be raised. Chrysippus answers more explicitly, one can always manage in tandem slowing the horses when the slope becomes steeper, or, de or decreasing with one hand while increasing with the other. For if it is a question of knowing why at this moment rather than at another, why water changes its state of quality at zero centigrade, the question is poorly stated in so far as zero is considered an ordinary point on the thermometer. But if it is considered, on the contrary, as a singular point, it is inseparable from the event occurring at that point, always being zero in relation to its realisation on the line of ordinary points, always forthcoming and already past. We may therefore propose a table of the development of language at the surface and of the donation of sense at the frontier between propositions and things. Such a table represents an organisation which is said to be secondary and proper to language. It is animated by the paradoxical element or aleatory point to which we have given various double names. To introduce this element as running through the two series at the surface, or as tracing between the two series the straight line of the aeon, amounts to the same thing. It is nonsense, and it defines the two verbal figures of nonsense. But precisely, because nonsense has an internal and original relation to sense, this paradoxical element bestows sense upon the terms of each series. The relative positions of these terms in relation to one another depend on their absolute position in relation to it. Sense is always an effect produced in the series by the instance which traverses them. This is, why, this is why sense, such as it is gathered over the line of the aeon, has two sides which correspond to the disymmetrical sides of the paradoxical element, one tending towards the series determined as signifying the other tending towards the series determined as signified. Sense insists in one of the series, propositions. It is that which can be expressed by propositions, but does not merge with the propositions which express it. 
Sense crops up suddenly in the other series, States of Affairs. It is the attribute of States of Affairs, but does not merge with the States of Affairs to which it is attributed, or with the things and qualities which realise it. What permits, therefore, the determination of one of those series as signifying, and of the other as signified, are precisely these two aspects of sense, insistence and extra being, and the two aspects of nonsense, or of the paradoxical element from which they derive. Empty square and supernumerary object, place without occupant in one series, and occupant without place in the other. This is why sense is the object of fundamental paradoxes which repeat the figures of nonsense, but the gift of sense occurs only when the conditions of signification are also being determined. The terms of the series, once provided with sense, will subsequently be submitted to these conditions in a tertiary organisation which will relate them to the laws of possible indications and manifestations, good sense, common sense. This presentation of a total deployment at the surface is necessarily affected at each of these points by an extreme and persistent fragility.